Good morning, University Covenant Church. Thank you. It's good to see you all here on this uh, lovely Sunday morning. I'm glad you're joining us. Uh, my name is Josh Anway. I'm the worship pastor here at UCC. And uh, we have a special morning for you in a number of ways. Uh, a lot of a lot of different things. Um, the summer is kind of exciting. We have breakaway coming up soon. But also we just get to share in uh, just this wonderful experience because this weekend is the Worship in Worship Leadership Institute uh, hosted um, here at UCC um, and working with InterVarsity. A lot of uh, InterVarsity worship leaders and staff are helping out, and uh, we got a number of friends that we get to share in worship with. We have a number of different new songs that we love to teach you, and uh, these guys are going to teach you, and I'd love to just help you get to know them and those songs that we might have as a, a gift for us as a congregation. So would you stand with us? Um, we're going to start off with a fairly familiar song, Break Every Chain. Also, you might also know it's a, uh, <laughs> it's Christmas in July, right? Can we get an amen for that? <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing the birth of Jesus today in the store. We're finally in the New Testament. And so it's kind of fun to, uh, to just call on the name of Jesus together. Let's do that.
name of Jesus that we call upon today and in our worship. But we know that God came in humble ways, as a baby in a manger, early, late night. And so we want to call upon that Jesus as well, to know that this is not just simple power as we know it, but instead power that comes in a different way. So let's sing, Oh Come, Let Us Adore. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh,
change it up a little bit. Go from gospel straight to uh, Spanish, actually. You guys ready for that? Cool. Well, me and Aaron. Hola. All right, so we are going to sing an entire song in Spanish, and that might sound terrifying to some of you. But it's okay. We're going to break it down. I'll help you with the pronunciation. I'll speak a line. You just repeat it right back after me. We say, Juan hermoso eres Jesús. Juan hermoso eres Jesús. Son tus palabras es tu amor. Son tus palabras es tu amor. Cuán glorioso eres Jesús. Cuán glorioso eres Jesús. Es tu poder fue tu cruz. Es tu poder fue tu cruz. La que me salvó. La que me salvó. Me rescató. Me rescató. Un momento ahí. Un momento ahí. Nos dio libertad. Nos dio libertad. Now it's mouthful, but we're going to say it a few times. It's going to be fine. We're going to fumble through it together. It's going to be super fun. So I'm going to sing the line now, and you sing it back to me. It goes like this. Juan hermoso es Jesús. Juan
Hear the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and with the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting along in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and it will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servants of the Lord, Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Before I introduce our scripture, I want to take a moment to lead us in prayer. For those of you who don't know, we've spent the last 22 weeks, we're in week number 22 on the story. Uh, We've essentially walked chronologically through the story of scripture to find out where do we find our place in the large story of God. 
Now, some of you have been saying, hey, hey, we're 20 weeks, 21 weeks in. When do we finally get to hear about Jesus? Anybody this week have a longing for Jesus? Is there anyone this week, maybe after 21 weeks in the Old Testament, or maybe just 21 minutes on your Facebook feed, say, where is Jesus? Is there anyone else who's saying, Lord, come quickly? Lord, where is your justice? Where is your peace? Where is your comfort? Where is Jesus? And to be honest, I'm not quite sure. But today we're going to pray. We're going to pray together as a church body, as a church family. We're going to pray for those whose lives have been impacted by tragic loss this week. We're going to pray for a country that's still divided by race and doesn't know how to have discourse together, but just knows how to be divided and cast stones from one side to the next. So will you come and join me in a prayer of comfort, a prayer of confession, and a prayer of hope, asking Jesus to step into our lives and the lives of those who are grieving this week. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we long for you. We confess that the world is not as it should be, and that is obvious. We pray for Alton Sterling. We pray for Castile. We pray for police officers who were killed in the line of duty and their families, their loved ones, their communities, and the countless numbers of lives that have been impacted with grief, with sadness, with anger, with questions, with confusion. And we pray for comfort. Lord, for those of us who just confess, we just want to confess that the world is not as it should be, but our nation and our lives have been broken by the power of sin. So Lord, we pray that you would bring your redemption and bring your justice. Lord, we long for your justice. Whether that be through human courts that you have set up or through divine justice that we know that we will experience upon your return, we pray for your justice so that your peace can reign throughout our nation and throughout our hearts. God, teach us to be a people who love well who cling to your love and your grace and your truth quicker than we cling to any sort of political banter or partisan ideology. But let us learn how to be a people that love not only those close to us, but somehow through your compassion, allow us to love those maybe we haven't even met yet, to grieve with those who grieve, to mourn with those who mourn. For we know that when one part of the body hurts, the entire part of the body feels it. So, Lord, enable us to love through compassion and empathy with those who are hurting this week. And please, 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 please come, Lord, to establish justice and truth and that your love and peace may reign not only over our hearts and our church and our town, but over our nation and this world. We pray for your comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, I have the opportunity to introduce to you our speaker. Erna Kim Hackett uh, is going to be able to preach and open God's word with us this morning. I had the privilege and opportunity to first hear from Erna at Urbana uh, this past year. Uh, when, and when I found that Erna was going to be here helping lead the Worship Leadership Institute, I said, hey, any chance we can get her to preach on Sunday? And so I called her earlier this week. True confession, I was actually scheduled to preach. But I called her and said, uh, we're talking about the birth of Jesus. If you were to talk about the birth of Jesus, what would you say? And like a sentence and a half in, I said, yeah, you're preaching this week. I'm done. I said, I I can't follow that. Uh, And so Erna uh, is graciously accepted a last minute invitation to be here and to preach God's word this morning. Uh, If 
Erna has been a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship for the last, on staff for the last 17 years. She spent 10 years doing a black student ministry and was just recently promoted to the Associate National Director of Urban Programs. Did I get that right? That is a long title. Um, so uh, will you please, please put your hands together and help me welcome Erna to preach this morning. Thanks. Good morning. Give me just a moment to get situated here as I share my space with the worship team. And all right, I'm going to be honest with you. Between first and second service, a whole page of my sermon disappeared. It's in my heart. <laughs> all right. Well, so I understand you've been journeying through the Old Testament, and I am excited to be able to open the New Testament to you and get talking about Jesus. So uh, I've been very, I've had a great time being with you. Did you enjoy getting to meet some of our students and our worship leaders? It's good. So uh, as we head into Luke, uh, I often, when I think about scripture, I picture it like it's a movie. And we have uh, ended with a really significant cliffhanger at the end of the Old Testament. There was this prophetic word. I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and children to their fathers. And, uh, and then it says, uh, and then the, uh, people will turn their hearts to me. This will be the sign. I'm going to come. And then just 400 years of silence. Because God knows how to make a dramatic pause. 400 years of silence. Suddenly we're in Luke, and we flash to Herod's temple. Now Josephus is a renowned Jewish historian, and he describes the temple in this way. It wanted for nothing that could astound either mind or eye, for being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, the sun no sooner was up that it radiated so fiery a flash that people strained to look at it. They were compelled to avert their eyes as looking at solar rays. That's an impassioned description by a Jewish historian. <laughs> of a temple. So this temple is up on a hill, and when the sun hits it, it just shines. And that's where Luke starts. So you're like, OK, 400 years of silence. Now we're at the temple. Something's about to happen. You can feel it. Now, all of a sudden, we have a country that's been waiting for 400 years, and then we meet Zechariah. Zechariah is a priest. He and his wife have also been waiting. They have wanted a child all of their lives. And they've been married for many years, but they've had no children. They're waiting as well. And now Zechariah is entering into the temple. Now we need to understand what a big deal this moment is. At that time, there were about 8,000 priests that served in Palestine. And so those 8,000 priests were divided up into 24 different divisions. And each division had about 300 priests. And Zechariah was in the Abijah division. And that division served for two weeks every year. And there were 56 priests in the temple every day. Now, every day those 56 priests would draw lots, and one of them who drew lots would get to go deeper into the temple to light incense. So the people would be standing outside praying, and then you get to go deeper in, light incense. As the, as the incense goes up, it's a symbol of the prayers of the people of God rising up. You only get to do it once in your life. Once you serve in that capacity, you don't get to draw lots again. Zechariah draws lots. He's going inside. He is at the pinnacle of his priestly career. We're in the temple. Zechariah is at the pinnacle of his priestly career. He goes deep inside. He lights the incense. And then suddenly, an angel shows up. So this is where, like, the background music just swells, right? The strings quick kick in, and it's like, mm, you just feel it. And, like, you lean forward in your seat. Like, we are about to have a God moment. And this angel says, Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. You are going to have a son. And this son is going to be great. And he's going to be the forerunner of Jesus himself, the one everyone's been waiting for. And Zechariah's response is unbelief. And the angel is so bothered by this response that he goes into what I call angelic smack talk. <laughs> because he's like, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> do you know where I just recently was? It was in the presence of God. My name's Gabriel. I was recently in the presence of God. You're not believing what I'm saying. 
so you should stop talking <laughs> for nine months <laughs> until you get your mouth right. And so Zechariah doesn't talk anymore. But that's a very anticlimactic opening. 400 years of silence, you're up in the temple, the angel shows up, and then Zechariah doesn't have the right response. It's like the needle on the record. <laughs> so what's happening? Now the camera pans back. We're panning back. We're leaving the temple. We're leaving Jerusalem. We're passing that first little suburb outside of Jerusalem. We're going to another town, going to a smaller town. We end up in a podunk town that nobody has ever heard of. Maybe being in Davis is helping me understand this story like a little bit better. I'm just messing with you. It's a Davis joke. Okay, so but they're out in the middle of nowhere, and the camera goes down little aisles, narrow alleyways. We end up in a house, and in this house is a young girl. She's probably 14 years old, 14, 13, 14, 15. And she is like every other girl of her time. She's illiterate, she's uneducated, she's going to get married, have lots of babies, some of them probably won't make it, and she will live and die in anonymity, just like every other girl. And the angel appears to her, it says, oh, favored one. And you can just feel the silence, like, who, to whom would you be addressing that? O oh, favored one, you've been chosen by the living God to partner with him in one of the most intimate ways you can partner with any being. Give birth to God's own child. And her response is one of faithfulness. She says, here am I. May it be to me according to your word. And this snapshot, this picture of the temple where you think think the center of the story is going to be. But then this picture of Mary, way over here on the margins, getting pulled to the center, pulled. She's a woman. She's a girl. She's unmarried. She's about to be pregnant. She's illiterate. She's uneducated. She's nobody. And yet she is pulled right to the center of the story. And this is what the kingdom of God is about. Before Jesus is even born, we know that this kingdom that Jesus is bringing is about taking people on the margins and pulling them to the center. And when Jesus starts his ministry, you see him continue this again and again. Right after his birth, people want to, the angels are so pumped. They're like singing their song, having their like choir just going on. And they're like, we can't hold, we can't hold back. They literally just rip through into our reality. And who gets to hear the most amazing choir performance ever? Shepherds pulled right to the center of the story. And when they go to the temple, who recognizes baby Jesus as the one that's been waited for? An old man and an old woman. And when Jesus starts his ministry, who does he pull to the center? A leper that nobody's going to touch. A demoniac who's on the other side of a lake, possessed with thousands of demons. He gets in a boat, goes to the margins, casts the demon out of him, all those demons out of him. Tax collectors, come sit right here at this table with me. A woman with a sketchy history. He goes to Samaria, out to the margins. And she becomes a citywide evangelist and the first person that Jesus reveals himself as the Christ. She is put at the center of the story. This is who Jesus is. This is what the kingdom of God is about. This is what we've been building towards for 22 weeks and for some people thousands of years. One of the most vivid images of this, of Jesus pulling people from the margins to the center, is the story of a bleeding woman. So it starts with a powerful man. And Jairus, uh, his daughter is sick, and like any desperate parent, he comes, he's willing to do anything. He comes to Jesus, says, will you come and heal my daughter? Jesus says, yes, I will. So the crowd is going. The crowd is going. And in the midst of that, there is a woman. And she has been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. I don't know how many of you have experienced extended illness or have someone you love who has experienced it, but it's awful. My mother had breast cancer. My stepfather died of cancer. I saw my father through an extended illness at the end of his life. It takes a toll emotionally, psychologically. It changes how people relate to you, and it can be so expensive. 
so expensive. And this woman has experienced all of that. Not only that, but she's a Jewish woman, so she's unclean, ceremonially unclean, so she's cut off from religious life. And she's so desperate. She's so far on the margins of her society. And she doesn't have someone like Jairus to advocate for her. So she comes in that crowd hiding, hiding, knowing she's not supposed to be there, but desperate, desperate for Jesus. And she sees him, and she, she's not going to go straight up to him, but she, if she could just touch him, she could get healed. So she reaches through, right, where the crowd pauses for a second. She just reaches through. She just touches his clothes, and she can just feel it in her body. She hasn't felt well for 12 years. And it just, you imagine it washing over her. I know me, like when I have a cold and I'm congested, I, after two days of congestion, I vow to Jesus I'll never take breathing for granted again. And that's just two days of congestion, 12 years. And then all of a sudden, Jesus stops everything. Somebody touched me. He knows power's gone out. Now, if you're this woman, that's terrifying. She didn't ask for that healing. She stole it. And for all she knows, Jesus is going to be like, I didn't give that to you. Lady, and I'm, I'm not down with this healing stealing that you're doing. <laughs> so he stops everything. He's like, who touched me? And his disciples, sassy brothers that they are, like, uh, Jesus, you're in a crowd. Like, a lot of people are touching you right now. And he's like, shh. And he just stands there and waits until this terrified woman who doesn't know what's going to happen comes out of the margins right to the center in front of Jesus. And it says he listens to her whole story. He listens to her story. This is uncommon. Why would a 30-something Jewish rabbi who's growing in popularity on his way to do something very important stop and listen to the story of an older Jewish woman who's got like extended years of female hemorrhaging that's not like a conversation that is commonly had among Jewish men and women in public while people are watching. But he's listening to her story because it's been painful and alienating and isolating, and she has suffered greatly. So he listens to a story that's so different from his own. And then he calls her daughter and makes her family and says, how much closer to the center can you get than to be in Jesus's family? You're hiding in the crowd, you're here, I'm listening to your story, you're my daughter, and let me affirm you in front of all these people, your faith has made you well. He affirms that she's been healed. He's not taking back the healing, he's blessing it. And then he speaks peace over her. This is who Jesus is. This is what the kingdom of God is about. And as I've been wrestling, looking at the news, watching these stories, seeing these videos, I've had to ask Jesus, how does this story, this truth about who you are, need to shape the way I'm listening to the news this week? So I want to talk about that for a second. I know that talking about race in church is people have different feelings about that. And especially when like the lady from out of town comes in and starts talking about it, <laughs> maybe people are starting to sweat a little bit. Or maybe that's why they gave it to the lady from out of town. <laughs> but I want to talk about what does it mean that Alton Sterling was shot this week? And what does it mean that Philando Castillo was shot? I'm not going to talk about the police officers, officers that were shot in Dallas, not because what happened to them isn't important. It's awful. It's so painful. I was watching a video that began to show their spouses and um, their children, and I just couldn't. I started bawling. I just, and it's not that their stories aren't important. It's that I know how to pay attention to their stories, but I know that it's easier for me to keep the story of my African-American brothers and sisters on the margins. I'm a Korean and white woman who grew up in the suburbs. So it's easy for me to keep the story of police brutality, what my African-American brothers are experiencing at the margins. 
that story is really different from my experience. But if I look at Jesus' model, he stops what he's doing. He lets his life be interrupted by this woman. And so I feel like, okay, I have to stop and just let regular life be interrupted. I can't just keep going on to the next thing I was doing. So, okay. The second thing I see that Jesus does is he listens to her story. Even though an issue of bleeding for an older woman is not something the average 30-year-old Jewish rabbi relates to, he listens to her story with love and compassion. So that means that even though it's not my experience to be harassed by the police, I have to listen to the story of my African-American brothers who are experiencing that constantly. And when they tell me that that's true, when she tells her story, Jesus doesn't go, I don't think you've actually been bleeding for 12 years. He believes her story. And so when my brothers tell me what's going on for them, I have to believe them. One of the people that, whose story I've been listening to very closely is a friend of mine named Sean. I have a picture of him if we can put that up. He would hate me for showing that picture, but that is like the only picture I have of us together. We were really excited to be at a conference together, so we took that selfie, but he would really wish I was showing a more dignified photo of us hanging out. We work for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship together, and uh, he is a dear friend. He really likes comics. He really is a nerd about that stuff. Um, I don't relate to that part of his life, but he's like really, he's, oh, he's really into the whole like superhero genre of things. But we both love our campus ministry so much and we talk a lot about it. And he started telling me his story. And we started, I started listening to his story in a unique way about two years ago after the shooting of Trayvon Martin. And if you don't remember, Trayvon Martin was a young African-American boy walking home from a convenience store with some uh, Snapple and some Skittles. And someone who was not a police officer followed him and shot him. And that person uh, was found not guilty and not sent to jail, and there was no consequences for that. And after that, he began to share some of his story with me. And he blogs, and so that's why I feel comfortable sharing this. I want to share some of the story that he put on his blog in response to what happened to Trayvon Martin because I think it's, we're still dealing with the same thing. He says, life as a black person, particularly me as a black man, will never be the same. This court case has reaffirmed that I cannot go alone into environments where I am the only black person, especially at night. I must dress my best at all times, even when I go to buy candy from the store. If someone questions my presence at any location, they're now justified to be the police. They can follow me and question me and I can't do anything. If I become angry for being followed, if a fight for whatever reason begins, my life can be taken away without consequences. Being black in America means there is a consistent negative portrayal of our culture in the media. We're dehumanized, portrayed as out of control, uneducated, dangerous, rarely positive, never accurate portrayals of black culture. This means changing my clothes, my walk, my very speech pattern when in cross-cultural environments to honor those around me at the sacrifice of my own culture. Being black is an invitation to be misunderstood at every level and in every conversation. Now listen to what he says here after he shares his story, which I'm trying to listen to and believe. It is the cross that we as black people are called to bear. My fear is that we will have to bear this cross in its entirety until the return of Jesus himself. I'm listening to his story. I love him. I believe him. His experience is totally different than mine, but I'm trying to enter in. And the invitation I would say for you is be interrupted. Sean's story is on the internet, Sean Watkins. You can Google that. 
If not his story, there are many others out there. And I think if we love this picture of the kingdom of God, if we love this picture of who Jesus is, if we love this idea that he takes people who are on the margins and brings them to the center, if that's compelling to you, I would say that right now, today, the application of that principle is to listen to our African-American brothers and sisters, to listen to the story, to how they're being put on the margins, and believe them and respond with compassion to say their family, to be a part of healing, and to speak peace. Jesus was born to an unwed teenage girl. And then he had to be on the run as a refugee to Northern Africa. And then he came back and worked in manual labor, never owned a home his whole life. So every kid who's born, without, who's, uh, born to a single parent Every kid who's raised by someone who isn't their biological father and every single person who's a refugee right now, not only did Jesus choose to care, he chose to live just like them. And he takes them from the margins to the center of the story by living their story. Later in his life, Jesus experiences police brutality. Jesus experiences capital punishment. He dies with two criminals on either side of him and a racial slur hanging over his head so that every person that's ever been racially profiled or experienced violence at the hands of the police or experienced prison or capital punishment, Jesus takes them from the margins and pulls them to the center of the story. Jesus is unbelievably compassionate, radically hospitable, full of authority. And this is who he is and what his birth means. I want to invite us to be a part of that kingdom today. Amen? Let me pray for us. Jesus, it, it is easy to leave stories hidden in the crowd. And I want to invite my brothers and sisters here at UCC today to be interrupted and to listen to what our African American brothers and sisters are saying and to believe them and to be a part of healing and speaking peace. Would you show us how to do that? Amen. Thanks, Erin, for sharing with us. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity when we get to share in gospel music and music of other cultures. But they also come with stories. They also, also come with experiences that, that many of us might not hear. But each of these, these songs that we're singing come from a place of knowledge of maybe some of these different things that, that we're just talking about today. So we'd like to invite you to join us in it once again. We're going to go through a couple of songs that we did earlier, uh, give you a chance now that you know a little bit more of them, uh, to be able to do that uh, with a little more confidence to say, you know this, some of the story behind the gospel music, and now you can sing it from a, in a place of knowledge uh, to say, this is something that I can relate to and stand in in some way. So um, as you stand, I'd like to invite you to stand. And uh, as you stand, I'd like to also introduce our offering. There are baskets on the sides of each row. And if you have your connection card, your offering and ties, I invite you to uh, pass those baskets down the row and put those on there. And now I'll hand it off, hand it off to Shed to introduce this song. Same song. Let's do it. <laughs>
up for doing that again. All right, all right, bye.
So this is a song that we were gifted all the way from Ghana. And it talks about just the supremacy of God and how in that country there are multiple deities, that the most high God is the one that we should serve. And even in our own country, there are competing uh, gods that we may serve, systems and politics and our jobs. And so this song says that above all that, above all those differences, we can unite around the most high God. like this. Totally beautiful, but born into total political chaos, an incredible celebration, 
and yet a poor family on the run from an unjust government. Profound worship, incredible displacement. We celebrate his birth, but we don't run away from the tensions and realities of the world that he was birthed into. And so family, as we go forth this week, would you also listen to the stories of those on the margins? Listen and believe. Listen and be instruments of healing and compassion and peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.